welcome to a practical guide to cybersecurity for small businesses. My name is Nick Ayanu and this is the companion video to my book with the same name. You can find my Amazon author page at amazon.com forward slash author forward slash Nick Ayanu. My latest book, Variety SM Press, is a practical guide to cybersecurity, though I've written or jointly written four other books. So let's get on with the practical advice. One of the first things I always get asked is why would cyber criminals target me? I'm only a small business. I have nothing of value. Thing is, that couldn't be further from the truth. We all have clients. We all have bank accounts. We all have computers, processing power and bandwidth. And the criminals use this to commit old fashioned extortion, fraud and theft. They also can use our computers against us or against other people to commit extortion, fraud and theft. Now we all know the extortion is ransomware, denial of service. The fraud is anything where you're tricked into paying for something and theft, well that can be our login credentials, our financial information, our contacts or our data. But the biggest thing the criminals want is to have unauthorized access to our systems. From then they can move to any one of these three at any point and change tactics to suit. The first step is to reduce your exposure. The less that can be attacked, the better. You can do this by moving things like your email to the cloud, to things like Office 365 or Google G Suite. You can move your databases to the cloud, your licensing, even your remote access. But one of the biggest things you need to do is to remove any old operating systems that no longer get security patches. Next, remove things like Java, Flash or Silverlight if they're not required for the business, as these are always full of vulnerabilities that the criminals exploit. And unless you're con constantly patching them, you'll be left with gaps. Also, don't be tempted to use illegal software. Chances are it will contain malware. The trial version that you turn into the full version via a key generator or crack utility, that is normally actually the malicious bit. And then because you're accepting it all, you end up with a, a virus or a Trojan or spyware at the least. It's not worth the risk considering things like Photoshop now only cost £10 a month on a subscription. Why risk it? Your internet routers are actually computers. And old routers are a security risk. So if you have anything over four years old, I'd seriously replace it. Also, you need to look at how much information you're giving away on social media that the criminals can use against you. Information that could help in a phishing attack or a way to help them defraud you. If you're giving away information that they can use to convince you that they're who they say they are, you need to look at what you're putting up online and decide whether it really needs to be there. Now, typically as a small business, you normally have no budget to speak of, but it's not just all about money. There are three elements that you need to protect your business and the technology is only one third of it. The people and processes count. The people is your employee awareness of what not to do and what to do. And the processes are the guidelines and instructions you have in place to protect them. Those two don't necessarily have to cost any money. There's lots of free training resources and free information to help you write your processes. Only you know your business, so only you can write those processes and instructions for people. You can visit organisations like learninfosec.co.uk or ESET even has its own cyber security training for free. On the more premium side, Hiscock Cyber Insurance actually has the CyberClear Training Academy. And there's also information online like the government's take five dash stop fraud. Now there's seven areas every small business needs to have adequate security cover. Missing one or two out will leave big gaps and it will make the others pointless. So you need to have something in place. It doesn't have to be an expensive solution. It can even be a free solution. The main thing is you have something. Because it's important to make sure you're not spending your security budget buying a Ferrari and leaving gaps when actually you need a whole range of different things in place. So let's look at antivirus. 
Now, the question is, why do I need antivirus if it's built into Windows? Well, yes, it is built into Windows, but it's very basic, which is why there's so many different solutions and vendors selling you premium antivirus. When it comes to choosing a premium antivirus solution, there's lots of things to look at, not just price. There's the performance, its ability to block ransomware, its firewall, whether it blocks zero day threats, it has a sandboxing feature, whether it's won awards, whether you can manage it from anywhere because it's based in the cloud. There's lots of things to look at. One of the biggest differences between home antivirus and business antivirus is the dashboard that you get. The business version lets you have an overview of all your users in their current state. So don't think that, oh, I'll get away with just home versions. There's also free options, especially on anti-ransomware. A secondary solution like Cyber Reasons Ransom Free is worth looking at. If you have any laptop users that are out on the road and connect to Wi-Fi, you may want to protect them with a virtual private network. This is a subscription service that filters all their network traffic and stops them being spied on or snooped. Next we have patch management. Patch management solution gives you an overview of all your users and the state of their software. It will automatically push out the updates according to your schedule and even gives you an overview of every bit of software installed. So if someone has installed something they're not supposed to, you'll know about it. When it comes to Windows, the security updates depend on the version you have. Bear in mind, Windows Vista and XP are no longer supported. We only have a year left of Windows 7, because after Christmas next year, support ends on the 14th of January. Even Windows 10, there's four versions that no longer get updates. And so we get slowly forced into later versions, whether you like it or not. Mobiles also need updates too, remember. iOS here, for Apple, has already been updated once already on the latest version. Version 11 was updated 14 times and version 10, 11 times. So you need to stay on top of the updates because the security fixes are important. Now, you don't have to pay if you don't have the money for patch management. You can manually do it and use free tools like Thycotic's Endpoint Application Discovery Tool to see what you need to patch. Moving on to email filtering. When it comes to email, there's only two types. There's a genuine email, or there's a bogus email. The bogus ones we know are where the criminals try to spoof a domain, they use display name deception, or even look-alike domains with you know, one or two characters slightly out but looks fine on a mobile but increasingly we have a problem of compromised credentials where they're using a genuine email system normally from someone we trust and sending emails without their knowledge to mainly everyone on their contact lists from this they can drop either a malicious attachment a malicious hyperlink or an attachment with the malicious hyperlink so this makes it a lot harder to stop when it's compromised credentials. But there's things you can do. One of the first things you can do is actually block uncommon attachment file types that you would never need to use unless you were a programmer or a developer. And then you can also set to quarantine any macro enabled office files. If you're on a system like Office 365, you can actually go into the security settings and add as many file types as you want to the common attachment types filter. You also need to block any programs from running that are held in zip files. Once again, in Office 365, this is an optional feature that can be turned on. Remember, an email can, can even contain another email that can contain something malicious. There's lots of options a criminals have. Emails are still the main infection route to get to our networks and systems. Blocking these emails before they get to us via a cloud-based filter is one of the best solutions you can implement. This is our results from September for a company with only 35 people, but as you can see, thousands of emails are getting blocked or rejected. I even created a custom rule to block anything 
that was below a certain size and had a URL, a URL shortener like Bitly. This is catching normally 150 plus emails every month. You can also enable things like DMARC to stop you being spoofed. It's actually free to set DMARC up, but configuring it can be a bit of a nightmare, which is why there's services like OnDMARC to help you. OnDMARC is actually free for really small businesses as well. Moving on to web filtering. It makes sense to filter all your web traffic. You can do this with a web proxy like Siren. Here you can go, actually go to their website and run a free test to see just how much you would block compared to their systems. It's quite inexpensive overall and because it filters everything before it gets to you, it stops a lot of things like malicious adverts. And also if you happen to click on a nasty virus in an email and it has to reach out to the internet, you get a second chance to block things. A web filter doesn't just block normal web traffic, you can also set it to block HTTPS traffic. Every month thousands of harmful activities are blocked and even my firewall blocks more things. So between the two you get a high degree of protection. The users are none the wiser because the malicious content just doesn't get downloaded. You can also filter your DNS. The DNS is what the lookup for when you type in a web address to where it actually needs to go. You can do this for free on a service called Quad9, where you actually change your DNS settings to 9.9.9.9. Next is admin privileges. Your admin rights equals a security risk. But there's no reason to run every user with full administration rights where they can install anything, change passwords, add users. The best thing to do is to set everyone as a standard user, create an additional administrator account on their machines if you're not on a domain. And then when you need to install something, they just select that account and give the credentials. It doesn't cost anything and will give you a really high degree of protection because if you can't do something, it also means the criminals typically can't do it either. There are application whitelisting and admin rights management solutions. I use one called CyberArk, which a program won't run unless it knows about it. And if anything needs admin rights, the dialog box is intercepted and the users never actually have to type the password. When it comes to access control, our passwords are one of the most important things we need to get right. There are a list of the worst passwords, believe it or not, and the criminals use these passwords and try them on different accounts and services. So password reuse is a big problem. So firstly, make sure no one is using any of the worst passwords from the previous year. If they are, change them. You can see the full list of entries by going to teamsid.com and looking for worst passwords 2017. The 2018 list will be out soon. But how do you remember so many passwords? Well, you can write it down, you can put it in a book, you can even put it in your phone. But there's also online services to help remember your passwords and even generate really strong passwords for you. You only have to remember one. It's worth looking at these password managers. Some are even free. The password isn't enough. What you need to also put in place is what's known as two-step verification or two-factor. This is where once you enter your username and password, you're then prompted for another code. Now this code can go to a smartphone app or a text message. But the main thing is just having a username and password isn't enough. So if you've been fished for your credentials, the criminal can't actually fully access your systems because they won't have your phone. You can set this up for free on a lot of services like Amazon, even Office 365, it's free for the user admins. And also protect things like LinkedIn, your firewalls, even your domain registrars like GoDaddy. Now you can check if your email has been part of a hack for free on a service called haveibeenpawned.com. It's pawned without an A. 
You can even select notify me and just enter everyone's email addresses and then they'll be emailed if you appear in a database that's been dumped online. If you have, you need to make sure that the password you've used hasn't been used anywhere else and then you start changing it if it has. Now backups are really important because if anything goes wrong and you are infected, your backups are the best remedy, and especially the best remedy for ransomware. How you back up is up to you, every business is different. And it also depends what you're recovering. I like a mixture of cloud backup with local backup servers, even portable disks. The thing is with anything portable, make sure it's encrypted. Try and have things in at least three places. One on your main system, one in the cloud, and one somewhere else, like another office, or another building. Also, it's important to make sure you have processes in place so people understand what to do if there is a security incident. Some antivirus companies even offer free posters and there's the NIST.gov cybersecurity framework that helps you work out all the stages and what to do. I would also consider having some alternative forms of communication in case there's an incident because if you have been compromised, you may not be able to use your normal systems like your email or any of the messaging linked to your email. So you can sign up for things like Slack or River so people can still function and communicate. It's important to actually have the processes worked out and you can do this for free as well on process.st. There's a free checklist. Also, I'd always recommend having a handy USB drive with an updated copy of some antivirus software like malware bytes. And also look things like the No More Ransom project is handy to know about. Now, what does all this cost to protect your small business? Well, actually, it roughly costs about the same as a premium latte a week. Antivirus and a combined patch management works out about £30 a year per person. Email filtering with an archive, 33. Web filtering, about the same. Even admin privilege and access control takes it to another 52. 150 pounds a year or 12 pound 50 a month. It's not a lot really considering what you're protecting because a ransomware infection could take out an entire office. It has done over the years. There's been all sorts of things that have happened. One council got infected and they had to go back to pen and paper for a week. Could your business survive for a week without the computers? Now my cyber defences work out slightly more at £22 per person per month. But then again, we're working for clients that expect a much higher degree of security. But just to show that just because you're a small business, it doesn't mean you can't protect yourselves. Using a mixture of premium and free solutions, you can cover all the bases. Now, in November, ITSM Press are offering a discount off the cover price of my paperback and ebook. Visit their website at itsmshop.co.uk and select security for more information. You can also find more security resources and advice on my website, boolean.co.uk. That's Boolean as in the maths term, Boolean logic. There you'll find links to my blog, which has over 450 posts of free software and useful resources, as well as links to my books and my GDPR spreadsheet. Thank you for listening.